Greetings, programs, and welcome back to a new episode of the Awesome Friday Podcast. My, I'm your host, and my name is Matthew, and a few housekeeping things to get out of the way because I am a professional. Um, so, uh, before I introduce Simon, I'm just going to go ahead and say that we love all of you, and if you like what you hear in the show, we do have a Patreon. That's the best way to support us. Uh, go to patreon.com slash mcsimpson, and every tier of our, of our uh, followers do get access to our uh, bonus chats each week. Um, and there's some other stuff we have planned, so don't feel like you're limited to the $2 a month plan, but they do start at $2 a month. Uh, this episode is also... Brought to you in part by Zencaster, uh, which is the platform we use to record our podcast. It is a very easy uh, and fully featured way to record, produce a podcast, and host it too. Uh, and right now, if you go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use the code Awesome Friday, or go to the link in the show notes, uh, you will get 30% off your first month yeah. of any paid plan, what? which is pretty great there'll be a little more detail at the end of the show for that um but yeah zencaster.com slash pricing code awesome friday uh and then last but not least um this episode is being produced during the 2023 writers guild of america and sag after strikes and without the labor of writers and actors who are currently on strike the films we're discussing here just would not be possible and wouldn't exist so uh get out there support support the strike support uh the labor of these people because the the con the uh implications of this strike are f farther reaching than you think they are but that is a totally different podcast so just know that uh we stand with all of the people currently on strike anyway uh now let's start the show hi my name is matthew hi. and here is simon say hello simon well, hello what a lovely way to introduce the the podcast. Congratulations. <coughs> I feel like we should do the Zencaster promo, though, like the American health companies, where they're not allowed to say what the, the health uh, supplement does, so they just repeat <laughs> the name over and over. Zencaster. 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 Maybe Zencaster's right for me. Hey, I use Zencaster. It's, uh, it's a wonderful <laughs> thing. Um, you know, that yeah. reminds me, this reminds me of a show that I don't think you've seen, but a show that I loved called Better Off Ted which uh, you should definitely watch. It's a sitcom. It only ran for two seasons, um, but it takes place in like a major like global research, a, a major global conglomerate, and the main character heads up a research team. And every episode features a commercial for the company that they work for. <laughs> and every commercial is just completely like a pitch perfect, but totally ridiculous version of one of those ads. And it's amazing. <laughs> Uh, it's it's a wonderful thing. But yes, and also uh, uh, very important that we note the, the strikes happening at the moment. Uh, I think it's important to be aware that <clears throat> the public perception of what actors are paid, uh, you're thinking that all actors are paid like Tom Cruise and George Clooney. And um, having spent decades of my life involved in the theater and stage acting industry it is mind numbing how many thousands of people are doing it for less than so many other jobs and there's very little job security and um there already was very little job security and for the streamers to now push the envelope more where they don't actually want to pay the creators for the creations they don't want to pay residuals and they're not interested in supporting the arts that i th it's really really important that they stick to their guns at the moment because it's a it's a very um it's a bit of a crossroads for the industry i think and they need to stand up for themselves so we wish them all the best of course and i hope they get i hope they just get paid netflix just lost in a day uh, so much valuation the money they lost in a day would have met all of sagafra's demands for the next 36 years mm-hmm it's not like and they can't afford it. They just don't want to pay the it. Principle of it, right? And and they've openly said they're just gonna. They're not even negotiating. They're gonna wait until these people run out of money and lose their houses. It is just the most. It's terrible and really indicative of how so much of this capitalist media society treats art and artists. It's it's terrible. So I wish them all the best. And like I said, this would be a different podcast, but also like the implications of this are much further and wider than you think they are because one of the key sort of sticking points is the use of AI 
And just to be clear up front, there is no way that AI can create art to the same degree that a human being can, just to get that out of the way. But also, if the studios get away with using AI to replace writers, do you think, think about your job, think about any job where you have to create anything. Do you think that those industries are not going to immediately push towards AI? Mm -hmm. Like any of you who are say like technical writers or any kind of content creation, um, those jobs are under threat from AI as well. And if we, if the writers guild is in particular, doesn't stick to their guns, like, and prove and show that like people will not stand for this, um, then no one's going to stand for it <laughs> and the studios are just going to run with it. And it's going to be a bad thing because an AI, and I mean, I think even calling them AI at this point is still a bit ridiculous because they're just number generators. Like mm -hmm. they, you know, but um, an AI can give you a, a pretty good remix of something, but it can't create anything new. And mm -hmm. it's just, that's just, that's just the truth. You know, there's no, if you, you know, if in the late seventies when Spielberg and um, Lucas were trying to get the rights for Tintin and they couldn't, so they made in, made Indiana Jones. If they had done that with AI, we just would have gotten a shitty version of Tintin, mm. right? As opposed to a fully fleshed out new character in Indiana Jones. So these are the types of things that are being fought for, and also you know the studios. And if you go looking for it, and it's not hard to find, there's all kinds of ridiculous strike breaking stuff going on, like construction uh, fences being put up around uh, Universal's headquarters to force picketers out into the street. Uh, Warner Brothers, I think it was, cut all the foliage off all the yeah. trees around Illegally. their studio. Now Illegally. The <clears throat> um, just to make sure the sun was beating down on these people. Um it's ridiculous and they just they don't want to pay and like you know the the head of warner brothers made so much money last year that if he gave up i think the number was 10 percent of his pay <clears throat> um he could fund the writer's demands for 50 years and it's just ridiculous so yeah. anyway like anyway. Support, support the strike union strong a high a high tide raises all ships so if you are a worker you should be supporting the strikes and yeah. i am very interested to find out what happens when the delivery workers of which there are three hundred and fifty thousand, <laughs> go on strike as well because that's yeah. that's coming um and further to your point, you know, there's 160,000 members of sag -Aftra. Like, And yes, there are the Matt Damons and Tom Cruises uh, of the world, but it only takes $26,000 a year of income in order to qualify for SAG health insurance. And most, many people, I don't know about most, but many people don't qualify in that, in that union. It is not... You know, not everyone is Tom Cruise. Not everyone is Matt Damon. Not everyone is the million dollar earners. Most people are the people who show up in the background or who show up in three or three to five shows a year and barely scrape by. Mm -hmm. So, and I mean, I could just go on about this forever, but the point is support the strike. Um, and we do. So, yes. yeah. Good. I mean, this is this is very relevant to one of the movies we're talking about this week that has been uh, doing the social media channels because uh, AI bros are trying to recreate this director's style and claiming to do everything from Star Wars to Lord of the Rings in this director's style. Uh, if, you want, if you want an indication of the gap of reality between the people creating this stuff and the actual stuff that they're trying to rip off, and their claims that one is as good as the other. Like, if you want a, a little peek into where AI creative arts is trying to go and the absolute dead-eyed bullshit that has been created and, and claimed to be the same quality, like, these are the things that you should be worried about. Yeah, I, I found a, saw, I saw a really good analogy for this, that, like, the AI bros today are the same type of people that, you know, if you were taking a photography class and you took a bad photo, they're the kind of guys who would be like, I need a new lens and not, I need to learn how to frame a photo better. Mm -hmm. 
you know, like obsessed with the tool and not the process. It's it's the same as like the widening frames, taking like Raise the Lost Ark and, and saying, oh, I, I widened the frame so we can see what's going on around it. It's like, do you want to just, just demonstrate? There's no better way for you to demonstrate that you don't understand this art on any level by yeah. changing the frames of the director. Like it just tells you everything you need to know. And it's, it looks shit as well. It looks really, really bad. So on every level, it's a failure. And it, uh, I, I'm waiting for this bubble to burst. I can't wait. Well, hopefully it comes crashing down like NFTs came crashing down. Do you know what the really nice thing is? That they've discovered that the because they've been scraping the internet illegally for the AI algorithms. And now, as you found if you do a Google search, there's so much AI shit both written and in image form across the internet, that the AIs are now being trained on bad AI representation and writing. Oh, yeah, they've all... It's causing the results to get worse and worse and worse because you've got this incestuous loop of AI feeding on itself. And so it's all getting bad now. And so everyone's panicking because their son, their golden goose isn't shitting out golden eggs anymore. Well, I mean, it's like that uh, that old saying that, you know, if you make a... It's like a VHS tape. If you make a copy of a copy, it's not quite as sharp. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's just that cycle ad nauseum. It's mm -hmm. really, it's the whole thing's really upsetting. The, the devaluation of art and artists is has always been kind of insidious in our society, and it's this is like the yeah. nadir of that. Anyway, yeah. um, so what, let's so, talk about it. so let's move on and talk about two pretty originally made movies, I think. Um, but let's start with the first one we're going to talk about, which is, I think, a logical place to start. Uh, and we're <laughs> going to start with it because it's been out a little bit longer. We're going to talk about the just released to streaming and on, de well, on demand anyway, um, okay. Wes Anderson's Asteroid City. Uh, and Simon, why don't you give us the lowdown, the basic lowdown on Asteroid City? Mm -hmm. um, because, spoiler alert, I'm pretty sure that you liked it more than I did. So I'm going to give you the lowdown based on what the trailers tell you. And what the trailers tell you is about half of what is relevant in this movie in terms of narrative. The trailers intentionally leave out a very major aspect of this film that I'm not going to touch on. So um, the <laughs> there's a town called Asteroid City and it's named Asteroid City because an asteroid 3,000 years ago, an asteroid uh, landed and is still there. And there's a crater and it has become this annual junior star gave the uh, award event. So they take kids from different schools and they uh, the kids enter their school projects, their scientific projects uh, in this competition. And then the winners are chosen and then they are brought together in this uh location to uh, award um medals to the winners in the categories and also to observe a celestial event of uh, uh, uh the lining up of certain celestial objects through viewers and it's uh it's it kind of feels a bit like a new mexico roswell situation where you've got this desert it's called city it's really a very 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 small town with a diner and some little cubicles you can stay in and it's clearly a tour one of these tourist cities that has built its entire income on being the place with the asteroid it, it, there's no other industry really here apart from um, steve carell's wonderful little um, hotel and um it's a, a, a meeting point for a host of intriguing characters uh, Jason Schwartzman's character with his kids, who um, and he's choosing the right time to tell them something, and suffering from it from himself as well. You've got Scarlett Johansson, who's a famous movie star, has come with her kid to be awarded uh, something else. Um, you've got a, a group of like cubs, uh, a school group of boys uh, with Maya Hawk as their teacher, and you've got a set of local cowboys and um and um hijinks and suit thing there's an extra element there's an extra visitor to asteroid city that is not expected and it um disrupts a few things and uh the story is very much wes anderson uh allowing his characters to exist within the story and if you've seen 
any of his other movies, you'll understand that his his style is to get people talking in a very deadpan way, but with great emotional um, involvement as well. And um, visually, it's uh, everything is a set. I'm going to be very careful how I talk, but it's very clearly a set. It's very clearly theatrically presented. And um, through their coming together in Asteroid City, the characters reveal more about themselves and uh, find an arc. <laughs> and that's all I really can say about this film. As, as, I mean, you're really, you're really dancing around a very important structural part of this film. And I think, yes. I think you're probably right for it. But it means that there's very little I can talk about about why I like this movie. <laughs> um, I, I mean, shall we? Shall we kind of reveal it a little bit? So I think there's two things that can be revealed in this movie, and one of them is a deadpan. Like, absolutely, we cannot talk about a thing that happens at about the midway point of this movie right. that changes everything. Yeah. But I don't think it's unfair, or because it happens immediately in the film. I don't think it's unfair to say to point out that everything in color is a play and yeah. that there are elements in this film that are in black and white and that is the the real world or at least the behind the scenes of said play uh-huh. um, because I think it that structure is kind of ingenious and I think it plays in a in a I think it works in a way where it almost like the two timelines thing can work in a film where there's definitely two narratives happening that are the same narrative at the same time, Mm. but for different Mm. reasons and uh, giving not everyone, but a lot of people in the movie sort of dual roles and dual purpose that exist in parallel to make the same point um, is pretty close to, I think maybe the cleverest thing that Wes Anderson has done in a long time. Mm-hmm. I don't think that this movie hangs together as a whole um, in the same way that maybe it should. Um, but it's hard to deny how clever and how meticulous and precise um, it's put together. Like it is, it, I know that's sort of a contradictory statement, but it doesn't, it doesn't a hundred percent work for me. But it is hard to deny the, and I say clockwork very specifically because the whole thing is very precise and runs like clockwork. And I very much appreciate how much effort has clearly gone into it. And how much, not just from Wes Anderson, but from from everyone who's involved would have to be 100% in on this. No one could phone anything in here because it is so, so precise. Um, and I, I worry that that will leave some people cold. Um because you could certainly read it that way, but I think I do think that that, technically speaking, this is one of his most accomplished films. Mm-hmm. The um, it's interesting. I've got a very interesting relationship with Wes Anderson, which you heard when we, if you listen to our special we did with Rachel last week, where I chose the French Dispatch as my movie of the last two years, deleting all other movies. And my my Wes Anderson relationship is that I basically don't like. 90% of his movies at all um, and I uh, the only exception being Fantastic Mr. Fox which I found interesting um, and what I found with Astro City and with French Dispatch is that they feel different from the rest of his output and that they feel a lot more self-reflective and a lot less smug and a lot more theatrical. So French Dispatch definitely plays with some theatrical presentation in its framing. And this overtly uses theatrical presentation in its narrative. It's a major part of the story. And I think it's fascinating. And I, I love it. Like as a theater person, I, I, I always love stories about the theater anyway. And so I, I didn't know. I wasn't expecting it at all because the trailer doesn't cover it rightly, I think. And so it, it is revealed within the first couple of frames. So it's not a major spoiler. But what is lovely is that the, um, the two sides of the narrative and the actors playing either themselves as actors or the characters the actors are playing, they, they reflect 
on each other. So as you get towards the end of the movie, one will make sense of the other and vice versa. And um, there's a particular, there's an emotion in this film that I believe is in there in, in French Dispatch that I didn't feel with any of his other movies. There's uh, a lot of it is down to Jason Schwartzman. I think this is... This Sir, is when, you, when you say an emotion, do you mean a specific emotion or just emotionality at all? Um, uh, both, really. Like, uh, there's, there's, uh, it's really hard to, to, to define this, but there's an emotionality in these two movies that I don't feel from his, any of his other films. And also, the specific emotion, like, I think Jason Schwartzman's uh, depiction of, of grief, I find really interesting in this film. And it kind of carries all the way through his interactions with Scarlett Johansson, who is fantastic in this film. Someone said that between um, between Scarlett Johansson in this movie and Downey Jr. in Oppenheimer, there's a whole uh, generation of moviegoers who are like, oh, the, the Marvel people can act as well. Mm. Um, and it's a nice reminder of how great she is. But Schwartzman's interaction, his, his, his whole thing is processing a certain grief and how to convey it and how to move on from it. And his later interactions with redacted as well um as the actor playing the character as well it's very very dense and it took me a good week to think about it but uh it does feel like the whole thing is about how to process and move on from grief and to remember love and move on through grief and i that really touched me it really really touched me and then outside of that you've got the whole idea of what it means to watch a story and to give yourself to the story. And you can only learn from a story if you commit to it. Like, and I think there's there's a lot of depth in it. You can read a lot of things into it, but I, I, uh, there's, what bothers me a lot these days is when people watch movies, they don't engage with it fully. Like they have the phones out if you're at home when I went to watch Mission Impossible this week, it's just people openly just talking and looking on their phones. And I, and this one of the messages of this film, I think, is about committing to a story. And you can't. I'm not going to quote it directly, but the 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 things you learn from the story are heightened if you give yourself to it completely. And there's one there's one very direct reference to. A, you as a person carrying on your story, even if you're not sure where it's going or what the outcomes are. And like all of that is just my stuff. Like I, within a theater framing, within actors, not sure how to play something successfully within the idea of moving on from grief. And then that very stylized look, like I, it really touched me. This film really, really, really uh, affected me in a good way. I mean, I, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely all of those things. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you exactly why I think, I think it might just boil down to, I think the, the, there's at a certain point in this film for me, it feels like things should be in disarray. And to be fair in the film, they are in disarray, <laughs> but also they're still ever so precisely in disarray. <laughs> Like, it's still very clockwork. It's still very... And, like, eh, it just feels like everything is placed just so. And for me, it feels like maybe they just should have thrown some stuff around on set rather than placing it just so. Like, I I get what it was going for. um, But it's not really successful because I think at a certain point... I don't want to say he should abandon his style, but I think he should allow it to be a little bit looser, if that makes sense. Like everything is so tightly controlled that it doesn't allow for the physical and emotional disarray that's going on in the moment. And I think it detracts from that a little bit. Um, but that's not to say it's a bad movie. Like I like the movie. <laughs> it's a, um, I'm perfectly happy to recommend that you watch it on anything but Prime, apparently. Apparently the color palette is effed on Prime, so do with oh, that really? information what you will. Oh, interesting. Yeah, big big controversy on film Twitter last night that the uh, the version on Prime is just like totally washed out. So hopefully they fix that. Um, 
But, uh, I mean, yeah, it's a good movie. It's a well-made movie. It's a brilliantly constructed movie. There are great performances all around. Um, you're highlighting Jason Schwartzman, um, which I think is uh, totally deserved. And Scarlett Johansson, also well-deserved. And not only because she's great, but because I think someone super famous needed to play this super famous character in the narrative. Like I think her star power really adds to the part mm -hmm. in a positive way. Um, I would also like to point out that Brian Cranston, who is, it sort of adds a third layer to the story because there is the, there's the play and then there's the behind the scenes of the play and the behind the scenes of the play is also like a television special about the play. So it's like, it's, it's, it's inception levels deep here. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Brian Cranston, who has a perfect fifties cadence uh, also gets what I think might be the single funniest thing that happens in the movie, which I will not spoil. <laughs> yeah. um, and you also just have people all around like Hong Chow is in this movie for like one scene and she just steals the whole thing. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, there's an unexpected cameo from another super famous person that I don't want to spoil who it is, but who also just like steals the scene that she's in entirely. I have um, such an important scene as well. Yeah. Um, and then you have just guys like Steve Carell who are in the background being just pitch perfect at what they're doing. Um, even Matt Dillon, who is a guy who I'm very hot cold on, like uh, in, the, in this particular case, I think he was really, really great as this sort of mechanic background character who yeah. is just around doing things, um, but manages to infuse what Lily has with a real personality in a way that I just didn't expect. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I really... think, I think last but not least the kid who plays, um, oh, what is his name? I've totally forgotten his name. Uh, the, the, uh, Jason Schwartzman's Jake son in the movie. Oh, Jake, Jake Ryan Woodrow. Yeah. Uh, he is great, yeah. and uh, I don't know exactly where they got him from, but yeah, he so. he is really, really, really good as the sort of brainiac son of um, Jason Schwartzman, and of someone who is. It's a really interesting line to tell because he plays like a young adult, um, and I think it's a really interesting performance when you consider that his character is highly intuitive and highly intelligent, but not necessarily emotionally sure of all of those things. Mm. Emotionally intelligent enough to like process some of the things that are going on around him. And I think it's a super interesting and for a film that is again, quite like clockwork precise. Mm. And I think a way that detracts from it sometimes, I think it's a role that has a lot of nuance from someone I've never seen before. And that's mm -hmm. very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I want to point out Jeffrey Wright as well. Jeffrey Wright in this own French dispatch are highlights of the film for me. I think he is amazing in this. And he gives a, a single speech that is uh, probably one of the best moments of the movie. Yeah, he has a, sing a single take monologue speech that is I give one of the other, I think. I think that the, the, one, the one moment with Brian Cranston I'm talking about is really just a moment. It's a perfectly hilarious moment that only works if the film is made the way it's made. But yeah, the um, Jeffrey Wright as the general is perfect. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't, I can totally see your reasoning about the preciseness of it. Uh, for me, it didn't stand up because it is a, 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 it is the stage show within the television special within the behind the scenes. Uh, so I didn't really have an issue with that. It, it worked for me, I think better than you. So how many stars are you landing with this one? Just three. I mean, just three. Three stars. It's a good movie. You should definitely see it. It's yeah. by no means my favorite Wes Anderson, but it's far from my least favorite. Yeah, sure. And I think... I, I don't I don't think his other films lack emotion in the same way you were implying before. Um, <clears throat> um, but I think this one does definitely... like. He's definitely processing something with this one. Yes, and I yes, always sure. appreciate that one. I always appreciate yeah. that. And again, like just on a technical level, it's... It's it's immaculately constructed. I am. Um, I really, really want to find a behind the scenes, uh, a B roll of him directing because I can't imagine. Like people come back to his cast over and over again. They're clearly having a good time on his sets and with him, and 
uh it's so precise and so deadpan and so like everything is so like clockwork and i would love to see how he directs that and doesn't make it an absolute chore for everyone because it's mm-hmm. clearly, people are clearly having good times on the sets but to make it that precise it, it's so controlling and usually actors like to have a tiny bit of freedom to to explore it a bit so um i'm fascinated at his directing style apparently he's very very shy to the point where you can actually look at scarlett johansson when she did a certain scene and uh, he kept um they had to do a couple of retakes because he kept nervous coughing <laughs> which is kind of, <laughs> kind, I mean, kind, of a, kind, kind of adorable yeah. i will say just to circle back to our earlier discussion of artificial intelligence and also just the social, the thing that stuck out to me was the social media um, sort of meme or trend, depending what platform you're on people going around, like trying to recreate his style. I think one of the things that they often miss, in fact, I would say go so far as to say always miss is how much he moves the camera. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Cause one thing that this film really makes clear is that he is not happy with a still camera. Like he definitely frames things. There's definitely like back and forth where the where the frame is set in a specific way, but there's also super long takes that involve the camera moving in incredibly complex ways. And <clears throat> I feel like not to harp on AI or anyone specifically, but like oftentimes when you see the recreation, it's just the sort of twee art direction style. As opposed to the fact that, like, sure, he might frame someone slightly off kilter or might do the thing where it's like, um, you know, quick cuts between frames of items with labels. But what you often miss is that, like, he swings the camera into that framing or out of it. Or there's some other interesting choice to get from A to B rather than just... or, or, Or even just people moving through frame, right? Or the camera... Oftentimes in, in the, the, the trend version of it, the social media version of it, it'll be like someone walking through a frame. But in reality, a lot of the time, the camera follows someone for an extended amount of time. And I feel like that just boils down. And just another point against AI, right? It doesn't, mm. it doesn't know how to do anything but it's the shallowest of imitations. And I do really appreciate having that reminder in this film. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's uh, it, like I said earlier. I don't want to repeat myself, but it's it's so apparent the gap of reality between the the bros who are typing things into Mid Journey and saying it's as good as this filmmaker, and you watch the two side by side, and it's it, it's so apparent the gap in quality and the lack of understanding of what makes art. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's just there on the table. You don't even have to look for it. It's right there. Yeah. Well, after that digression, so I'm giving it three. How many stars is it for you? Sorry, it's a full star for me. I really enjoyed it. It's. Uh, I still think French Dispatch is a better movie for me, but I I really like this film, and it is. I thought about it a lot afterwards as well to try and work out how, what the hell I thought was happening at the end, but um, it it unfurls really nicely the more you think about it. So it's a full star for me. Nice one. Uh, so me three and you four and either way, uh, go see it because it's a great movie yes. Yes. and it's available on demand now. Um, and you can rent it wherever and you should totally do that. There will be streaming links in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's move on. Um, and we're going to talk about another movie that's not exactly brand new, but is new to us. So we're going to talk now about the seventh entry in the Mission Impossible franchise. We're going to talk about Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, uh, which is the latest excuse for Tom Cruise to jump off of something. Uh, and written and directed by his enabler, Christopher McQuarrie. Uh, <laughs> um, it is a fairly direct sequel to his previous two entries in the franchise, being Fallout and Rogue Nation in reverse order. Mm-hmm. Featuring the return of Cruz as Ethan Hunt, uh, Simon Pegg, uh, Ving Rhames, uh, Rebecca Ferguson, Vanessa Kirby. Basically the entire Mission Impossible um, cast, if you will, from Macquarie's run on these films. Um, the film picks up, uh, starts actually with a cold open. Uh, it's actually 
kind of James Bondy in a way. It starts with a cold open on a Russian submarine mm. where there is uh, a thing that happens. Um, basically, they believe they're attacked and they're not. And they, the submarine ends up sunk and there's a key to the mysterious uh, bad guy, which turns out to be an artificial intelligence that is heretofore re- uh, referred to as the Entity. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically to make a very long story short, cause it is a long movie. It is. Um, the entity wants is self-aware, or at least they believe it's about to be self-aware at the very least. Um, and every government in the world wants to gain control of it. And Ethan Hunt goes, this is way too dangerous. I am going to destroy it. And he's the only one to think that because of course he is because he's Ethan Hunt. And this is what sets everything in motion. It's the reason that this time they are rogue, because let's be honest, they go rogue almost every time in in this franchise. Um, But basically, everyone's chasing after this key. Uh, The key unlocks a MacGuffin. It's a MacGuffin that unlocks a thing that might allow them to um, either control or destroy the entity. But no one knows exactly what it is, except for we, the audience, because we get to see it in the first... Uh, scene for sequence um in the process of trying to get this key and then also give it to the bad guys so they can track it to whatever it unlocks we meet a new person played by Haley atwell who's called grace she is a thief a pickpocket and a criminal um and we also meet a bad guy whose name is gabriel played by si morales who is has some ties to Ethan Hunt's pre-Mission Impossible or IMF past. Um, I don't really want to say too much more than that, um, but I will say that I, and I know this is going to come as a shock, if anyone who's listened to our bonus conversation from a week or two ago where I explicitly said I love all of these movies, um, will not be surprised to learn that I really like this movie as well. Um, I think that Ethan Hunt has, or that Tom Cruise rather, because they are inseparable, has a lot of good chances to do some capital A acting, which I very much appreciate. I think that the supporting team has never been in better form. Uh, In particular, I really appreciated uh, Simon Pegg in this one. Um, I think there's a couple of great supporting performances. There's one, I think, great performance on the villain side, even though it's a bit tropey from Pom Clementiev who you probably know is Mantis from Guardians of the Galaxy. She plays the henchman of Gabriel, and she is just electric on screen at every single moment she's in frame. Um, and yeah, also Tom Cruise base jumps off a huge cliff wearing a parachute off of a motorbike, uh, and it's pretty spectacular. <laughs> I don't know about you. It, I don't think it quite lives up to some of the stuff in the last one, but it's still a pretty spectacular stunt. Like, I feel like these movies are just an excuse for Tom Cruise to jump off of stuff. And I'm fine with that. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. The stunt, I've seen that stunt before. That stunt's done in uh, in um, uh, Goldeneye. Almost the exact same stunt, except there's an airplane involved this time uh, in Goldeneye. So, but it is so I'm going I'm 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 to disagree because, gonna... because it's actually done for real this time. <laughs> I will say that's the key oh, difference here. Yeah, yeah. All right, so that is an extra element, and he's they've still CG the the thing he jumps off, but I I don't know. The I mean, no, the only this... the only CG part though is that like they built a ramp and they CG the ramp into being yes. a rock, like that's the extent of the CG in the scene. Yeah, the the but the cliff doesn't look like that at all that they built the ramp on. But that's fine. Look, the great thing about this stunt is that the stunt begins. Uh, uh, okay. We've already seen the stunt because they showed it to us so much uh, in the in the run up to the film. It was a major part of the marketing. Here's how we almost killed Tom Cruise this time. I mean, it's here, the poster. It's it's the yeah. first poster for the movie. So was the stunt? My, my first point is don't show us the stunt beforehand. I want to be in the cinema and think and not think. Oh, okay, the bike jump is coming up. I've seen this from every angle. I've seen how they make it. I know exactly who that you did it. I don't. I don't necessarily want to know that. I want to be. Uh, holy shit, he's really doing it. And the great thing about the stunt, actually, is that it's the 
scene, the unbroken shot of him jumping off the cliff starts with a close up on his face with and he delivers a line about getting on the thing he's trying to get on. And it and it doesn't cut away as he then spools away and jumps off the ramp. And so it's very, 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 very clear that it's him. There's mm-hmm. no like there's no uh like Texas switch where he, suddenly it's a stunt man. And uh I that would have been way more effective for me in the cinema if I hadn't seen it a million times. Like I enjoyed the line delivery, which we hadn't seen before leading to the jump. But anyway, that's that's a marketing point. We're always gonna be sold the this is this is now the Tom Cruise stunt in this movie. And unfortunately, they've kind of painted themselves into that corner now that this is what people expect. Like they have to one up themselves each time. And I actually think the stunt is uh, uh what was the one in the last it was climbing in the aeroplane was the last movie right that was the big so in in fallout the two big stunts there was a couple of big stunts one was the um he's being suspended he's like on the cargo payload that's being flown by a helicopter and he's climbing up the rope in real oh, life and another one was the like apparently days he spent climbing a cliff face uh and then the the I big mean, the big one though was he jumped out of an airplane at thirty six thousand feet like a yeah. hundred and five times or something. Yeah, the helo jump. So yeah. I think the the Burj Khalifa um, leap has really established these movies as needing at least one big uh, stunt they can use in pre movie marketing, and so that's just that's just the normal way of it now. Um, but the uh, I, there's so much of this movie I liked and there's quite a bit of this movie that left me cold and it's a really interesting balance for me because I adore Fallout. I absolutely, uh, I think, have we had this on air about Rogue Nation? Rogue Nation is probably my number one Mission Impossible um, and uh, Fallout very, very close, maybe joint one or maybe just number two. And I don't think this lives up to either of those in terms of flow in terms of uh how ethan is ethan's part in the story as well but also i really really admire christopher mccrory as a director because he's uh, up until him every mission impossible was directed by a different director and so it gave them a different flavor and he's been very open in that he wants to use different techniques even different crews for each one that he directs to give this idea of a, a different flavor to mission impossible and he does the same here with some very distinct camera angles and cinematography and uh, the way to shoot certain uh, action scenes. And it doesn't all work for me. Some of the shots here I, didn't work for me at all. Um, but the the stuff that does work in this movie is top, top tier entertainment. There's a great mask moment, as there should be in every Mission Impossible hmm. Uh, I love the, the the pre-credits scene. I thought it was fantastic. Hayley Atwell is the most attractive person on the planet. And, and in this movie, Hayley Atwell keeps doing that smiling looking thing. Uh, and do you know the thing I mean? Where she does... That. Everyone knows the thing you mean. <laughs> right. There's a part, the part, there's part... There's one part where a very... In the middle of probably one of the best car chases I've ever seen... In a franchise of great car chases, I think this has the greatest. It's multi-layered. It's it's directed as a dialogue scene, but with action car races. It's just perfect. And in the middle of this, he can't get one of the cars started. And he and Tom Cruise, people forget how good Tom Cruise is at comedy. And he doesn't overplay it. And he kind of has the skittish approach to comedy. And it's really, really good. Mm-hmm. And at one point, he's trying to start the car. It's like, oh, usually they change it sometimes. And Hayley Atwell's just next to him, looking at him, going, it's okay, it's fine, no problem. And I'm like, I actually got in trouble with my wife for the number of times I openly gasped when she <laughs> was on screen and she did one of those looks. And she has a really interesting arc. She has more to do in this movie than just be the pretty pickpocket. She she goes places and she's a wonderful actor anyway. And, and just, I can't... <sighs> Spectacular. And that car chase is top tier. And um, I love anything on trains as well. So that's good. Pom Klementov was amazing. When do we see her leading a, fracture, a franchise of action movies? Because the 
she, the, the presence she's got on screen, just for her little looks and little smiles, she doesn't say very much, uh, but she uh, she just is absolutely the most eye catching performance uh, in a, in a role that could have just been another hench role. Uh, she is brilliant, and yeah, um, there's there's definitely some criticism to be had there in that like the silent Asian henchman yeah, is definitely yeah. a trope. Yeah. But she, I mean, it, I think it also like she's so good in in the moments, especially in the car chase you're talking about, where she's one of the pursuers, and she is having the time of her life. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. driving I'm... this huge little person driving a huge car. <laughs> um, crashing through everything and and just like enjoying every second of it. She just she just eats all the scenery in that film, and I loved it. In that no, scene, I, I yeah, absolutely right. And on the on the note of that wonderful car chase, if we can compare it to Vin Diesel CGing his way down steps in Fast X versus um, those two cars going down steps in, in this movie, not just uh, steps, the same steps, the same. Oh, it's the same steps. It's, it's literally the same staircase. Right. Yeah. And in Fast X, it looks like they've forgotten what gravity is. And I don't know. Obviously, the best CG is the stuff you can't tell, right? So I have no idea in Mission Impossible. I get a feeling that it's Tom Cruise, so they probably drove those cars down the steps for real. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were were probably on rigs, so they didn't bust the suspension like immediately. But um, it looks amazing. Like The cars move like cars. And uh, the, the whole car chase... There's, there's a certain uh, authenticity to a car, an actual car skidding around a corner between two other cars uh, compared to the CG version of it. And mm-hmm. um, it's the, uh, also whoever edited this movie should get an Oscar because the editing of that car chase is like Macquarie can shoot the shit out of it, but without the editing getting the pacing right, the back and forth, it's like three stages of a chase in, in various vehicles with dialogue with stops and starts with comedy with Pom Klementov being amazing it's just brilliant it's worth the price of admission alone so maybe that maybe it peaked a little too soon I don't know on the flip, on the flip side it Mission Impossibles have to have exposition. They have to be like, here's the problem. Here's how we're going to fix it. This is what we're going to do. And in this movie, they didn't do much else than really have the gang sat around a table going, okay, this is this is our problem. This is what we're going to do. And um, I thought creatively, it didn't uh, it didn't hit home as well as the last two movies. So it's a bit of a balance for me. And there's a, there's one pure moment of fluke that saves an integral character later that really annoyed me because that should I don't want the the fate of one person decided by the pure luck of another person. Um, all of these movies, the the team predicts and reacts and plans, and so I don't I don't want the final uh, moment to be uh, a matter of luck. Does that make sense? It does, um, but in the same way that like. Uh... So I have a couple things to say. First, just going back to the car chase for just a moment, like there is, so there's definitely CG in the car chase, but where it is, especially on the steps is that they definitely, so I haven't seen any behind the scenes, but they definitely drove those cars down those steps. The difference will be that as in rogue nation, where they drove cars down a very historic flight of steps, they will have put like ramps and such in the way to prevent them from being damaged and then CG them out after the fact. Mm Mm-hmm. Right, so there's definitely so the CG. Stuff, the, the stuff we're not watching is the CG stuff, right? Exactly. Um, but just coming back to, to your point about um, that, Macquarie's done a pretty good job of making the tone and feel of each of his three films so far quite different. I think one of my problems was that this one didn't actually feel different enough because. Hmm. As opposed to, you know, the Rogue Nation to follow Jump, it's literally just a different crew. Like, it's a different cinematographer. Um, it's a, a different composer. It's a different ton of stuff. And this one, though, like, the composer's reused. The cinematographer is the, uh, was like the first AD or something. He was on the previous, like, a lot of the people are just people who are on the previous film and who've been elevated to a new yeah. position. And I think the writing is pretty successful at this it's definitely got a lighter tone it's definitely a lot more comedic 
And I think that moment you're talking about, that pure luck moment, is just part of that trying to make it a funnier movie than the last one. Because the last one was actually quite somber by comparison, a little bit melancholy by comparison. And I think this one tries to be funnier, but doesn't quite get like it does a pretty good job, but it doesn't quite get there in terms of like radically changing the tone enough. Mm -hmm. Um, And if anything, that moment you're talking about might just be evidence of that, because I think it is. I didn't think it was bad, but I did think that it was a little bit tacked on, maybe would be the way to put it. Like Mm -hmm. you do kind of expect Ethan Hunt to be very very precise and it is a moment of like yeah exactly you know but that being said like we've definitely had those moments in the past like ethan hunt is not only the most skilled agent in the world he's also just the luckiest you know like and we've definitely had moments uh there's a great moment in mission impossible 3 where he base jumps off the top of a building and crashes into a lower floor in front of a, a maintenance worker. And then the wind picks up his parachute and pulls him back out the window. And it's really funny. <laughs> and, and Tom Cruise knows, and like the beginning of rogue nation is another great example where he's on the plane and he's about to release this payload of bad things. The bad guys are trying to steal. And he like straps himself to the to the payload, and the bad guys are like, "What?" And he's like, eh, "This is what's going to happen." <laughs> it's just like it, and it yeah. got like these comedic moments are not out of place in the movies, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and, that's how it was, the comedy is. I think yeah. I think what it really boils down to for me is that this is very much Dead Reckoning Part One, mm. right? I feel like it's a little exposition heavy without actually telling us very much at the same time like it tells us a lot about the immediacy of what's happening but we get there's a a lot of talk about like who is gabriel and then no answers you know there's a lot of stuff that's just going to be explained in the second movie and i feel like the movie suffers for it like it doesn't quite stand alone enough in terms of the writing to really be truly great i think that when the second one comes out and I've said, this is the third time I've said this this year, which by the way, is just like super weird. But if the third, if the next one comes out and it sticks the landing, I think together they might legitimately be one of the best entries in the franchise. Um, But on its own, it just, it's not, it's incomplete. And therefore it just kind of can't be, you know? And I, yeah. and I felt the same way about across the spider verse. And I felt the same way about fast 10 that like the, ending in the middle and telling us to come back next year is kind of a problem. Uh, Problems may be the wrong word, but like, I feel like these movies are incomplete and therefore can't really be great. Right. Mm. It's uh, even, even though I liked all of them. I, uh, I also think that an AI antagonist is nowhere near as interesting as someone like Sean Harris or like or um or philip seymour hoffman like i well i i i don't like gabriel was weird as well because gabriel at times gabriel's working for the entity so that's the human face and pom then's working paris is working for him but also gabriel's trying to control his way out of the entity's grip at the same time and the entity being the big bad was just not that interesting to me I don't know. I think it was pretty on point for the way the world is going right now. <laughs> but as a narrative in an action movie, it just didn't find that. But but again, it have the face. I know? feel like this is all all part of the like. It's part one, and we don't know anything about like we don't know anything about the bad guy. Like who is Gabriel? We have no idea. We just know that he has some tie to Ethan, and none of it is explained. And I don't think he's ever trying to control the entity. I think he's fully given over to being the entity's pawn. <sighs> So I, but, I felt that but he is one... after he is after the same MacGuffin though, like just yeah. for different reasons. And it I just may... feel like I, the the best way I've seen it put is that the most he offers at any given point is menacing handsomeness. <laughs> <laughs> he is very handsome. That's true. Um, and there's a certain he does. So the one thing I will say about this movie that I do appreciate, and it's going to be really hard to talk about without it being a spoiler. And just to be clear, I'm very conflicted about this moment, but I appreciate it is that there is a character death, a fairly major character death. And I feel like they're kind of damned if they do and damned if they didn't with it. Because on the one hand, it's a character I like. And on the other hand, if they didn't kill a character I like, the film would have no stakes. Like, it, like the bad guys would not feel dangerous at all. 
because this movie does have a villain problem. You're right. The the entity, like Gabriel, is not fleshed out to the point where I give a shit, and the entity isn't is an AI that's off screen basically entirely. Mm. Um, so it this is a film that has an absence of an antagonist in a way. Um, but that one, the one character death is significant. And I I appreciate that they, they they at least had the balls to do it, you know. Um, I don't I don't know that I agree with it because again I really love the character, um, and an, another person joins the team basically immediately. But also, so many franchises just wouldn't do it, mm. you know. Like, it's not that often that a Marvel hero dies. It's not that often that someone on you know, the fast 10 family dies. And I feel like this, this franchise has had that problem for a little while. Like people die in these movies, but no one major has died since I think three. So I appreciate that they've added back at least some element that, Oh shit, the bad guys are serious. Like we can't just plan our way out of it, you know? Yeah. But I don't, death has no meaning in filmmaking, in franchise filmmaking, anymore. I think in Mission Impossible, Mission Impossible, it basically has to, right? Yeah, I don't know. I would, I would be surprised if it doesn't get reversed at this point. But um, I don't know. See, Mission Impossible has masks, and it definitely has a way to bring a character back because you could just slap a mask on someone, and they probably will do that just in some future movie to be like to throw Ethan off guard psychologically, but they can't bring that. Like they don't have resurrection machines. Right. And unlike other franchises, like say fast 10, we definitely see the body. (laughs) Uh, So like, it does feel pretty final to me. And like I say, I don't expect, I wouldn't be surprised if the actor comes back, but I don't expect to see the character back. Uh huh. On the subject of masks, uh, one thing I will say, because I don't want to be overly negative about this movie, because when it works, it works brilliantly, and it does one of my favourite things, which is kind of a Mission Impossible thing now, where you have an actor acting as a different character, acting as their character. You've got a person pretending to be a person pretending to be a person, and it's just one of my favourite things. And it's done brilliantly. The actor who does it in this film, who I thought was kind of underused in their earlier scene uh absolutely like dominates when they come back and they have all the affectations of this other character but they're being themselves being the character being them uh uh pretty, does a really really good job i mean you talked earlier about a certain person being the most attractive person in the world but i would <laughs> i would posit that that is that is not true not to say they are unattractive but also vanessa kirby is in this movie and she does do a little like sneer, bite, smile thing at oh, Tom man. Cruise at one point. That yeah, yeah, she's got the whole Natalie Dormer kind of look, hasn't she? That that's a very specific. I will. <laughs> yeah. What a surprise! I've gone for the sultry blonde, and uh, I've gone for the sultry brunette, and you've gone for the uh, very um, the sassy uh, blonde. Leading sa- the sassy blonde, and I've gone for the sultry br- brunette. Who yeah. could have seen that coming? I don't. But, no uh, one. No one could possibly see it coming. <laughs> yeah, but she's she's great in this film, and I'm really glad because the, there's a scene, her main scene. I actually don't like that scene at all. I think it's really jumbled. I, I don't think it's very clear what people's intentions are. Um, but so I was really happy when she got um, a major part to play in the, in the last kind of uh, sequence because it really showed what a great actor she is as well. Vanessa Kirby's really really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is there is actually one choice that I don't want to spoil. There's one choice they make in that later scene where it's Vanessa Kirby. It's one person. She's pretending to be someone pretending to be her. And they, they make a choice to leave out a certain thing. Uh, yeah. And it baffles me. Because it's so... It, it detracts from it. But like... Mm-hmm. Anyway. Oh, I, know I don't know. About, yeah. how, uh, how many stars are you going to give this latest impossible mission, sir? So... I this is a solid three star movie. There's a lot of this film that didn't work for me compared, especially compared to the other two. But as a standalone, I think it, the exposition is not great and um, it's kind of disjointed. I didn't like the extreme camera angles and the fighting as well. But on the flip side, uh, the the 
car chase, the the mask work, the the stunt work, Tom Cruise being like the last action hero. It's just great stuff, and it's really great stuff to watch in the cinema. So this is a three star movie for me. Yeah, it's a four star movie for me. I still really liked it. No, there's nothing you're saying that's wrong. Um, or that I even don't agree with, but it's still a four star movie for me. I love these stupid movies. I mm-hmm. love every second of all all of them, uh, and I think it's still a franchise with no bad entries. Uh, so mm-hmm. do with that information what you will. Um, it's a wholly different podcast, but I would like someone to fully explain to me the structure of the IMF because that seems to change in every single movie. <laughs> um, but that's really like that's yeah. just a joke. It doesn't matter. Is the, is the answer? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah so it's a four star for me and if you get a chance to see it on the biggest screen you can you should definitely take it yeah, it's yeah. it's about to be obliterated by Barbenheimer weekend which is a choice um, I don't I don't get studio scheduling but uh, you know definitely it's your chance to see it in a mostly empty theater basically because everyone's going to be seeing Barbie and Oppenheimer this week mm-hmm. uh, which I think if all goes to plan we'll be talking about next week so right, there's but- there's that that's my Tuesday night. <clears throat> yeah, and I've already seen them both, so I, uh, you know, we'll we'll have a lot to talk about for sure. Sure will. Yeah, but I think we're going to wrap it up there, unless Simon has anything you want to add. No, no. Uh, yeah. Again, both of these films, I kind of wish I'd seen Asteroid City on the big screen, and uh, uh, even though people are terrible in cinema these days uh, in terms of talking and using the phones, you're these are both really good big wide movies to watch on the big screen so try and try and get out and see mission impossible while, it, while you still can yeah actually on that point the there's a cinema near me that shows things in non imax 70 millimeter and the the last movie there right as of now it's oppenheimer and last week it was asteroid city and i wish i'd taken the time to go see it in 70 millimeter because i think like visually it's stunning Oh, yeah, gorgeous. Anyway, uh, well, we're going to call it there because we both have to go. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, one more time, if you have enjoyed uh, what you have heard, uh, we do have a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Simpson, and tiers start at as low as $2 a month. Uh, and everyone who subscribes gets access to all those tiers, uh, to all of our bonus, uh, not our tiers, to our bonus uh, conversations. Uh I'm also, uh, and this is going to be news to Simon, but I'm also going to start for the higher tiers. I'm going to start asking you for our bonus uh, question prompts. Uh, So I think that'll be interesting. Uh, You can also find us on the socials. Um, The show is at awesome Friday CA on Instagram and Twitter. Um, And rather than list off all the places where we have social accounts, I'm just going to say you can find my homepage at stretched.ca and you can find Simon's homepage at temporarypen.com and you can find all of our recent work uh, and all of our social media connections there. It's going to be a lot easier and those will be in the show notes. Indeed. <clears throat> um, stay tuned for immediately after this for the Zencaster ad that'll explain a little bit more about how to redeem that 30% discount and uh, last but not least, um, a second to last but not least, again, Union Strong, support the Union. Uh, last but not least, we record this here in Vancouver on the unceded ancestral territory of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish nations. And one last time, thank you so much for listening. We love you all, and thank you for joining us on this awesome Friday. We love you, bye! Hey again, friends. One last note, as stated earlier, this episode is brought to you in part by Zencaster, uh, which is the easy-to-use recording and producing tool for podcasts. Uh, it is super easy to get started. You sign in and log in with the web browser. All of your guests get to record their tracks separately and in up to 4K audio and video. Uh, and you get to feel a sense of ease as everything is backed up in multiple ways and all of your audio and video stays in great quality even if the connection is unstable for you or any of your guests. We use Zencaster every week to record and it couldn't be easier. I just log in, create a new episode, and send a link to Simon and suddenly we are talking with audio and with video. And right now, it couldn't be easier for you to get started either. Go to zencaster.com forward slash pricing and use my code AWESOMEFRIDAY and you will get 30% off your first month of any Zencaster paid plan. 
We want you to have the same easy experience as we do for all of our podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. So once again, that is Zencaster.com forward slash pricing or check our show notes where you can just click on our offer link and again, save 30% off your first month of any Zencaster paid plan. We look forward to hearing your show.